morning, everyone. I'll be introducing Radley Balco. He is an American journalist. Can you guys hear me? Okay. He is an American journalist, author, blogger, and speaker who writes about criminal justice, the drug war, and civil liberties for the Washington Post. He was previously a senior writer and investigative reporter at the Huff Huffington Post. He is the author of The Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces, and his work has been cited by the U.S. Supreme Court and the Mississippi Supreme Court. Radley also writes about the music and culture of Nashville, Tennessee, where he lives. A graduate of Indiana University, Radley has also been a senior editor at Reason Magazine, a, po a policy analyst at the Cattle Institute, and an opinion columnist for foxnews.com. Let's please welcome Radley Balco. Thank you. Um, Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the drug war, and particularly the history of the drug war uh, being concentrated on uh, communities of color in America. Um, in the summer of 1969, the Nixon White House was ramping up a legislative push uh, for its crime bill. Uh, one of the central pieces of that bill is what Nixon would later call the war on drugs. The previous year, Nixon had run on a campaign appealing to what he called the silent majority, or the ignored Americans. This, of course, was an era of uh, protest, rioting, civil unrest, uh, and uh, soaring crime rates, uh, admittedly. A more, a more uh, cynical way of categorizing Nixon's campaign, and probably a more accurate one, was this was an effort to make middle-class white people fear black crime. Um, among the policies that were part of this platform, uh, loose search warrants. These were warrants that uh, Nixon's people wanted police to be able to get it would basically just say, we are looking for evidence of a specific crime. It would not, it, the, the warrants would not have required any specificity as to location uh, or suspect. Basically, they would say, we're looking for drugs in this neighborhood. We want to be able to search every house on this block. This, of course, uh, is a, uh, a pretty flagrant violation of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the, the loose search warrants bore a striking resemblance to the writs of assistance, which uh, it were the, the, the very reason uh, the pre pre-revolutionary writs of assistance, uh, which were the very reason why we have a Fourth Amendment in the first place. Uh, it included a provision called the no-knock raid. Up until this campaign, uh, police did conduct no-knock raids, but they conducted them uh, by they would get a search warrant, they would get to the scene, uh, and then they would, uh, some sort of exigent circumstance, maybe they would hear somebody getting beaten inside the house or see somebody uh, maybe loading a gun through a window, and they would decide that they have to enter without knocking and announcing uh, themselves, and then they would later have to justify it to a judge. What Nixon did was he made this a policy. You could get a no-knock raid before the, the, actually executing the warrant, uh, and then execute the warrant without knocking or announcing. This violated uh, about five centuries of common law, going back to English common law, uh, and violated a very uh, important principle called the Castle Doctrine, which is this idea that the home should be a place of peace and sanctuary. Uh, the Nixon people also included a provision that would have allowed prosecutors to appeal acquittals, uh, which obviously is a pretty blatant violation of the Double Jeopardy Clause in the Constitution. Uh, it would have allowed police to administer or demand uh, urine samples, uh, basically on demand after raiding people's homes, uh, to then test them for drugs and then arrest them for possession for the drugs that were allegedly in their bodies. Um, it was a pretty awful, draconian, unconstitutional crime bill. Uh, it ran into opposition in the Senate Judiciary Committee from a pretty unlikely source. There was a senator from North Carolina named Sam Irvin, a former segregationist, uh, but who also considered himself a constitutionalist and was appalled by what was in this bill uh, and, and basically made it his mission uh, to stop the bill from becoming law. So the Nixonites changed their strategy. They'd first imposed these laws on the city of Washington, D.C., which of course is a majority black city, but also a city where the federal government has jurisdiction. Um, three years ago, the, the, the city of Washington had actually just elected its first independent uh, black mayor. But by switching, uh, and imposing these laws on D.C., the Nixon people could push the bills, not through the judiciary committees of both houses where there was opposition, uh, but through the D.C. oversight committees. Uh, and helpfully, uh, in the House, uh, the D.C. oversight committee 
uh, was uh, chaired by a guy named uh, John McMillan, uh, a representative uh, from, I believe it was South Carolina, uh, who would be an ally. Uh, the Nixon people knew he'd be an ally because three years ago, shortly after D.C. had elected its black mayor, McMillan uh, congratulated him by having a truck of watermelons delivered to the mayor's residence. The Nixon campaign then ramped up the rhetoric, tying, uh, trying to try drug use to violent crime uh, and violent crime to the black community. Uh, this despite little data to support any of these connections. The media played along willingly. In March of 1970, the New York Times ran an article about how tourists were allegedly too scared to even visit the White House due to crime in the nation's capital. In discussing how some blacks in D.C. had become distrustful of police, author James Batten wrote, quote, In the slums of Washington, as in the hamlets of South Vietnam, the natives wish to protect fugitives from the authorities. Uh, this was in the New York Times. Uh, so there was a, a massive dehumanization campaign of, of drug offenders, dehumanizations of entire communities of color, uh, forged by the Nixon campaign and also supported pretty willingly uh, by pretty large institutions in the media. Um, the bill did pass, although with some of the more egregious constitutional violations were removed, uh, but it was the first indication that the modern drug war, the one that we're still engaged in today, uh, would have uh, a disproportionate impact on communities of color uh, and not by accident or by happenstance. happenstance. You're gonna hear a lot of statistics today about arrest rates, conviction rates, incarceration rates. You'll hear about how my minority communities are destroyed by the use of informants, the ubiquitous use of SWAT teams and other weapons of drug prohibition. But I think it's important to remember that this was all by design. All along, this was by design. Of course, none of Nick, Nick, what Nixon did uh, was all that new either. Uh, the somewhat less aggressive policy of drug prohibition that had been in place up until Nixon uh, was also passed by demonizing and dehumanizing entire groups of people, whether it was blacks, Chinese immigrants, or Native Americans. Henry Anslinger, the first head of the federal agency that would later become the DEA, didn't even attempt to hide any of this. Uh, a quote from Anslinger, there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S., and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana use. The marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and others. Reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Um, so the drug war, of course, had always been rooted in sort of blatant appeals to racism, blatant dehumanization of entire communities. But let's go back to Nixon. Oddly, uh, one of the programs impl uh, Nixon implemented shortly after taking office uh, was actually working, uh, but it was a program that he didn't want to take credit for. Uh, Nixon had actually uh, earmarked uh, uh, about uh, $50 million in federal funding uh, also to the city of Washington, D.C. to open methadone clinics. Uh, these clinics were actually working not only in getting people uh, off of heroin, uh, but crime was actually dropping uh, in D.C. because there were fewer uh, addicts, also because there were fewer people who wanted to use heroin, and therefore there were fewer uh, heroin dealers that were fighting over turf uh, and so forth. Um, but the Nixon campaign needed to drum up the fear uh, in order to get their crime bill passed. So they actually, uh, and Nix officials in the Nixon administration have since uh, admitted this in interviews, they actually hid the data that crime was actually going down in D.C. and these methadone clinics were working uh, in order to keep people good and afraid uh, of crime so that there would be more support for the crime bill. Um, so 1972 comes along, we have, now we have a re-election. Um, once again, the Nixon people need to scare the public into voting for him. Uh, at this point, Nixon assembled a team led by G. Gordon Liddy that would launch basically an all-out PR assault uh, in an effort to scare the country about crime all over again. Um, th the assault would include uh, paying Hollywood to insert anti-drug messages into uh, te television shows and movies. Uh, it would also include, however, uh, inviting high-level elite journalists to the White House for sort of closed sessions uh, and strategy sessions on how they could sort of uh, perpetuate a lot of these uh, Nixonian messages about uh, the dangers of drugs uh, in the media. Um, in 19, January of 1972, the New York Times published a report on an epidemic, what it called an epidemic of, quote, heroin babies. Uh, this would, of course, be the template for later stories we'd see about crack babies, meth babies, and oxy babies. Um, the Times described in lurid detail a trembling, clenching newborn, a tiny rat of a thing who scratches and claws at its own skin, 
uh, and included an illustration of an alien of an alien-like fetus getting a fix with the caption, "An artist's concep conception of the elements in a growing form of urban tragedy: uh, a newborn child and a glassine ba bag of heroin." Uh, the Times painted mothers, minority mothers in particular, as indifferent, zombified monsters who, quote, have no joy of motherhood. Um, without even an anecdote, much less empirical data, the Times reported that some mothers inject their babies with heroin to stop them from crying. Uh, and that, quote, it is not even uncommon for an addict to sell her children for drug money. Again, they gave no specific examples of this ever happening. Um, Addiction multiplies, the article read, quote, Harlem is an area where heroin is legal tender. It pays the painter, plumber, and the police lawyer defending a man on charges of drug possession. Were there any long-term effects of any of, of heroin babies? Well, the author couldn't say. It was impossible to follow up because the fractured and disorganized nature of, quote, for example, some areas of Harlem. Here, the liberal New York Times had had wrapped, the allegedly liberal New York Times, had wrapped drugs, crime, and blacks all up in one terrifying six-page uh, six package. Uh, and for the Nixon campaign, which was embarked on this dehumanization campaign of drug offenders uh, and this effort to link them to the black community, um, this was a package wrapped up with a bow. I'll give you one more quote from the article. Quote, some of these women are so badly disturbed that their behavior, that their behavioral resembles, excuse me, their behavior resembles that of the famous motherless monkeys of Dr. Harry Harlow's study. The author then describes how uh, monkeys raised without mothers would sometimes throw the baby against the wall and beat its head on the floor uh, until the staff feared for the infant monkey's life. The propriety of comparing uh, black women addicted to drugs to apes apparently escaped the Times editors. At about the same time, the intellectual conservative movement was growing. A new group of academics on the right were attempting to, take, uh, to add some scholarly heft to Nixon's anti-crime policies, particularly those policies aimed at black Americans. Some of what they wrote was pretty shocking. Men like Robert Bork, who would later become uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, nominee to the Supreme Court, Ernest Fonden Hogg, James Q. Wilson, and James Burnham could be found on the pages of commentary, the public interest, and occasionally National Review. They and the magazines that published them would then become enormously influential a decade later during the Reagan administration. Um, Ernest Banfield, a political scientist at the University of Pennsylvania who advised both Richard uh, Nixon and Ronald Reagan, for example, once wrote of America's cities, quote, so long as the city contains a sizable lower class, nothing can be done about its problems. The lower class individual lives from moment to moment. Impulse governs his behavior. Whatever he cannot consume immediately, he considers valueless. Um, again, these were people who had later become pretty prominent advisors uh, in the Reagan administration. Um, <clears throat> in 1972, so then Nixon sort of formally declares war on drugs with a speech where he sort of paints himself as Winston Churchill, uh, and he's sort of standing on the beaches of, uh, of or, you know, sort of storming the beaches of Normandy uh, with a rifle in his hand uh, in order to save the country from the scourge of drugs. Um, Nixon's uh, Effective drug czar at the time, Miles Ambrose, described drug users as the very vermin of humanity. Uh, again, uh, a, a, an effort to dehumanize uh, drug offenders because, of course, in order to declare war on a group of people, you first have to dehumanize them to the people who will be doing the fighting. Um, so let's jump forward to the Reagan administration. Um, the Reagan administration really ramps up the war on pot and marijuana. Uh, Ryan Grimm, uh, my former editor at the Huffington Post, wrote a, a book uh, where he talks about this and finds some empirical evidence that uh, the war on pot in some ways was, was a little bit, was, was somewhat successful and that at least reduced the supply of pot coming into the country. What it did instead uh, was people who were importing drugs then switched to another uh, cheap uh, drug that was pretty uh, easily made and that could be sold in bulk quantities, uh, which was uh, crack cocaine. Uh, and so in some ways, Reagan's war on crack, uh, or war on pot, actually ushered in uh, the crack epidemic, of course, which also had a disproportionate effect on, uh, on communities of color. Um, there's also, of course, the little matter of uh, the fact that there were federal agencies, including the CIA, that were actively uh, selling crack uh, in black communities, a uh, pretty horrifying chapter in our country's history that once was dismissed as a conspiracy theory and is now pretty much widely accepted. Um, <clears throat> Again, there was lots of media compliance. Uh, the Reagan administration really ramped up the war rhetoric, tried to make the drug war metaphor very literal. Reagan at one point declared drugs a threat to U.S. national security. Uh, he had uh, some of his officials, William Bennett, who would later become our first drug czar at one point, uh, uh, 
said on Larry King Live that he would, have, he would have no moral objection to beheading drug dealers on live television. Um, Daryl Gates, who uh, would found sort of the father of the SWAT team, would become a very prominent uh, drug warrior. Gates, at one point, also on Larry King Live, seemed to be where a lot of really bad ideas were tested, um, said at one point that drug use, not even drug dealing, but drug use was treason, and that drug users should be taken out in the street and shot. Um, this is a policy that he would walk back when his son was arrested for drug possession, <laughs> twice. Um, Again, the media sort of willingly played along. Um, I don't think that the media is particularly uh, um, anti-drug so much as they love a good scare story. And so the Reagan administration was regularly feeding the media scare stories, uh, and the media was lapping it, lapping it up. Um, in uh, 1985, CBS Evening News aired dramatic footi footage uh, of an alleged cocaine-addicted baby shaking and convulsing. Um, the baby actually was found out later was not addicted to cocaine, uh, but it didn't matter because they were going to do a story about crack babies and any baby that was shaking and convulsing would do. Um, other, media, other media outlets jumped on. The baby in that story was actually white, uh, but by the time the crack epidemic hit, the white babies featured in these stories quickly turned black and cocaine babies turned into crack babies. Uh, the national media would continue to run the crack baby stories for years, all of them with dire predictions and calls to action. As late as 1991, Time Magazine still feared that crack kids, quote, will grow into an unmanageable multitude of disturbed and disruptive youth. They'll be a lost generation. Uh, new laws pa were passed out of uh, the crack baby uh, alleged academic uh, epidemic, including man uh, new mandatory minimum laws, laws that uh, in some states required and still require uh, new recent mothers to be drug tested immediately after birth. If the, if the test comes back positive, the child is taken away from them. Uh, and laws that we now now have in several, uh, particularly in southern states, uh, where women who are found to have used drugs during pregnancy can actually be criminally prosecuted for child abuse. If, uh, the, if they have a miscarriage and were also found to have used drugs, they can be pro actually prosecuted for murder. This has actually happened twice in Mississippi and once in Alabama. And this, was, this all stems from these uh, uh, scare stories about crack babies. Um, 2009, uh, a study came out looking back at the crack baby uh, alleged epidemic uh, and found actually that uh, even one, it was overstated, the number of babies who were born addicted to crack was way overstated and overestimated. But second, even among those who were, um, it wasn't clear that being uh, born, or having a mother using uh, cocaine during pregnancy had that uh, big of a health impact on the child's life. In fact, what the study found uh, was that the most damaging thing about being a crack baby uh, was the fact that you were referred to as a crack baby uh, and the effect that that could have on these kids' uh, uh, sort of self-esteem and psychology uh, as they grew up. Um, <clears throat> but the scare stories continued. Drug use actually declined in the first part of the 1980s uh, overall, as did overdose deaths. Uh, but the Reagan administration really, again, needed to, to scare up a, a, a lot of hype. Again, uh, the, the media complied. Uh, this is one of my favorite articles of, or, or sort of editorials on drug wars. This is from Time Magazine in 1986. Quote, to a nation that espouses self-reliance, drug dependence has emerged as the dark side of the American character, the price of freedom. It's as if America, so vain and self-consciously fit, has looked upon itself and suddenly seen the hideous, consumptive portrait of Dorian Gray. The country, it seems, uh, is awash with drugs. Fine white powder pours past the border patrol like sand through a sieve. On busy street corners and in urban parks, pushers murmur, Crack it up, crack it up, like some kind of evil incantation bewitching susceptible children and threatening society's sense of order and security. Um, this was actually, I said that was an editorial, that actually was from a, new, a straight news article in Time Magazine, not from an editorial. Time doesn't run editorials. Um, as I said, editorial, or excuse me, <laughs> drug use was actually down over this period. Um, the, the hype turned to, of course, public service announcements, Saturday morning cartoons. I have a running feature uh, on the blog of uh, drug war propaganda, and some of my favorites are some of the stuff, the commercials you would see during Saturday morning cartoons. Um, but these, again, uh, were dehumanizing. There was an effort specifically to, to link drug use to the black community. Uh, one of the more pernicious ones, there's a, a, a black teenager who's basically trying to entice children into committing drugs. Uh, and over the course of the commercial, which is about a minute long, he slowly morphs into a, a snake and slithers off into the darkness. Um, between March and October of 1986, NBC ran more than 400 reports about the drug war. When the White House began pushing the idea of mandatory drug tests at the office, Time ran a cover story about why that was a great idea. 
When the Reagans made uh, uh, <clears throat> their uh, heavy sale for a bigger, bolder drug war, uh, Time magazine put uh, them on the cover. In all, drugs made the cover of Time five times in 1986 uh, and five times in Newsweek. Uh, then there's the, the militarization of police, which, like uh, most other uh, drug war problems, it has a disproportionate effect on uh, communities of color. Uh, again, there's media compliance here. So the Reagan administration really kind of uh, uh, ramped up the use of SWAT teams across the country. One, by making surplus military available to police departments across the country, uh, which we, of course we see today with the 1033 program and with the Department of Homeland Security grants. Reagan administration also created a series of anti-drug grants that were solely tied to drug policing. So if your cops went out and arrested a murder suspect, uh, are you guys hearing me okay? I'm getting a little feedback up here, okay. Um, so if, you're, if, you're, if your police officers go out and arrest a murder or a rape suspect, there's no federal money tied to that. If you go out and arrest a couple of low-level drug offenders, there is federal money tied to that. In fact, uh, there have been studies breaking down, uh, some local newspapers have done studies breaking out just how much money. Uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, there was a study a few years ago that uh, found that each drug arrest brought in about $500 to the local police department. Um, so if you're a, a local sheriff or police chief, uh, you can imagine how these policies play out on the ground, right? You get all this cool equipment from the Pentagon, uh, so you start a SWAT team with it, because why not? Everyone else is doing it. Now you can keep your SWAT team in reserve and wait for an uh, active shooter or a hostage situation, the kinds of situations where a SWAT is, is appropriate, or you can start sending your SWAT team now out on drug raids for pretty low-level drug offenses and start generating revenue for your police department, both through these grants and through civil asset forfeiture. Uh, and so we see basically an explosion in the number and use of SWAT teams across the country. Um, in, 19, in the late 70s, there were about 300 SWAT raids per year across the entire United States. By the early 80s, that's up to about 3,000 per year. By 2005, we're looking at 50,000 SWAT deployments per year in the United States. Um, studies by uh, the ACLU, uh, the criminal criminologist Peter Kraska, uh, local newspapers generally found uh, that these raids are widely uh, disproportionately waged on communities of color uh, and that about 75 to 80 percent of them are to serve warrants on people suspected of drug crimes, not, uh, you know, to rescue hostages or to stop active shooters. Um, Again, the media played along with this. Uh, in 1986, CBS News sent a camera crew along with a SWAT team on a drug raid. Um, the team broke down a door and overcame a, a suspected, uh, overtook a suspected crack house. Um, in the following years, this would become sort of a chestnut of local news. Uh, it actually doesn't, you don't see it all that often anymore, but on the local news, pretty much once or twice a week, one of the networks would follow a SWAT team on one of these raids and basically show sort of the middle class community of America, uh, you know, just how uh, the drug war is being fought on the ground and there was wide support for it. Um, <clears throat> One of my uh, favorite examples of this was uh, came actually in the early 90s. Uh, I think it was an ex episode of uh, the CBS Evening News. They sent a SWAT team, or a camera crew along with a SWAT team that raided a public housing complex. Uh, this was shortly after the Clinton administration imposed a new zero tolerance policy for drugs in public housing. It meant that if the cops found even a single joint in your house and you lived in public housing, even if it wasn't yours, if it was a guest's, uh, you were immediately evicted from public housing, no questions asked. Uh, and on this particular raid, a SWAT team, a uh, camera crew accompanied a SWAT team for this extraordinarily violent raid uh, on this uh, mother who was probably in her early 60s, had two teenage sons. Uh, you know, everyone's thrown to the ground, guns are put to people's heads. Uh, they find basically a couple of joints uh, in a drawer in a bedroom. And this was championed both by the network by, and by the police and by the Clinton administration as a sort of triumph in the war on drugs, the fact that these people would now be evicted from their public housing over a couple of joints. Um, all of these, this, this sort of uh, uh, glorification of police militarization, glorification of, of this kind of force for these low-level crimes, really, I think, made the country very uh, comfortable and accustomed to the idea of using militarized force on a regular basis in communities of color. Um, in uh, the late 80s, uh, Daryl Gates, going back to Los Angeles, launched a, something called Operation Hammer, uh, which imposed curfews in black and Latino communities uh, and uh, commenced with massive uh, SWAT raids. In fact, there was a 150% increase in the number of SWAT raids in Los Angeles after Operation Hammer took effect. At one point, the LA Times estimated that these, uh, these raids, which generally only resulted in uh, possession arrests, 
Uh, but because of these raids, there were communities in Los Angeles where 75 percent uh, of black men under 30 had been arrested uh, in one of these raids in some neighborhoods. Um, when a, a, um, a state senator was con who, who had supported Operation Hammer was confronted with, confronted with these statistics uh, by the LA Times, she responded, quote, when you have a state of war, civil rights are suspended for the duration of the conflict. Um, <clears throat> how much time do I have? We... Okay. Um, in September 1989, a poll by the Washington Post and ABC News, 62% of the country said that they would be willing to give up a few of the freedoms uh, of their freedoms if it meant that we could greatly reduce the drug supply. Now, of course, uh, a vast majority of that 62% probably weren't going to have to give up their own freedoms. Uh, the question probably would have been better worded, are you willing to give up the freedoms of other people in order to diminish the drug supply? Um, in Boston, uh, police cracked down on uh, communities of color with stop and frick searches of any suspected drug dealers uh, under the justification that anyone who is even suspected of carrying drugs, quote, caused fear in the community and therefore deserved to be arrested. Um, Superior, uh, Suffolk Superior Court Judge Cortland Mathers described the new policy uh, later uh, after it had been in effect for over a year as, quote, in effect, a proclamation of martial law in Roxbury for a narrow class of people, main, uh, mainly young blacks. Uh, this was a, a white judge later making this proclamation. Um, a Boston Globe article in September described how these, uh, this, what was essentially an occupation in some neighborhoods, was de degrading an entire generation's view of the police and poisoning the relationship between the police and these communities. Um, In November 1990, uh, I'll just give you a few other sort of examples. In November 1990, 45 police officers dressed in camouflage and black hoods raided an entire block of homes in North Carolina. They're from the Chapel Hill and Carborough Police Departments, the Orange County Sheriff's Department, and the North, North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. The raids were called Operation Ready Rock. Uh, they went on for four hours. According to the subsequent lawsuit, everyone raided and apprehended was black. Uh, the astonishing search warrant uh, affidavit condemned an entire street of people. The officer asserted, quote, we believe there are no innocent people who live on this street, only drug dealers and drug buyers. Uh, a judge uh, incredibly signed off on this warrant to basically raid an entire street of people. Um, the raids, uh, despite the, uh, the assertions of the police officer that everybody on this street was guilty, uh, the raids resulted just 13 arrests. Uh, 11 of them were for misdemeanor uh, possession. Uh, in 1993, uh, when the, when the, uh, the judge who overheard this law, the subsequent lawsuit, uh, he actually berated the officers in a three-page statement that he read in front of a crowded courtroom. Um, five years later, however, uh, the entire street was raided again in a very similar operation. Um, these sweeps became common. Uh, so if you remember, the, the, Nixon, the Nixon administration had tried to get Congress to pass this idea of a loose search warrant. Uh, and had been talked out of the idea because it was blatantly unconstitutional. Um, so there was never a formal law for loose search warrants, but what we did start to see in the 80s and 90s, and actually it's still done today, uh, are basically a de facto loose search warrant where the police go to the judge and basically get permission to raid uh, entire housing complexes or entire streets or uh, neighborhoods. Um, blanket warrants, they were called during the Reagan administration, although you know, no, they wouldn't admit publicly that this is what they were doing. They'd have very military sounding code names like Operation Pressure Point, Operation Clean Sweep, Operation Sting. Um, in 1987, Ed Meese himself, the Attorney General, went to Philadelphia to personally oversee a sweep uh, on the north side of the community that targeted uh, drug users. At, um, at the time, it was the largest such operation in U.S. history. Uh, troops raided block to block, neighborhood to, uh, neighborhood, to na neighborhood, which is a strategy, of course, that self-evidently discriminates uh, if you're pre predominantly raiding minority neighborhoods. Um, <clears throat> the, the second uh, uh, phase of Operation Ready Rock, by the way, uh, wrought, brought in 106 arrests. Uh, of those, 101 were black uh, and five were Latino. Um, so let's go jump into the 90s. Um, after the Rodney King meeting in, in uh, 1991, Mayor Tom Bradley asked uh, Warren Christopher to chair a commission looking into excessive force at LAPD. Uh, what the commission found was pretty significant and still pretty relevant today. Um, the, the, the commission basically uh, found that not only was sort of police officer misconduct and officer brutality pretty rampant, 
uh, but that there was, it was open, that there was a culture within LAPD that was so uh, uh, militaristic that they didn't even sort of attempt to hide uh, their uh, uh, abuse of force uh, or their sort of contempt for entire communities of people. Um, there was a uh, uh, transcripts, they were able to obtain transcripts of radio transmissions where cops said that things that were blatantly and explicitly uh, racist. And, you know, the, the, the surprising thing the commission found wasn't just that the cops were saying these things to one another, but that they were so, this was uh, such a part of the culture at LAPD that they were saying them over open, uh, open radio lines. Um, and the commission also found basically that the drug war uh, and particularly sort of the, 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 the uh, rhetoric and language that use, is used to wage the drug war uh, condition these cops to see these entire communities basically not as citizens with rights but as potential criminals. Um, we see this kind of dehumanization of uh, entire communities, of black communities over and over again. Uh, and uh, Peter Kraska, the criminologist who's been studying SWAT teams for since basically the, the late 1980s, um, <clears throat> in his uh, uh, eth uh, ethnography where he sort of embedded himself with a SWAT team in the Midwest, uh, had one police chief in the Midwest tell him, uh, when, the soldiers ride, when the soldiers ride in uh, for a SWAT raid, uh, you should see those blacks scatter. That's an exact quote. Uh, former uh, San Jose police chief and militarization critic Joseph McNamara told National Journal in 2000 that a recent SWAT conference he had attended, uh, officers were wearing these very disturbing shirts. This is a direct quote. In the front, there were pictures of SWAT officers dressed in dark uniforms, wearing helmets and holding submachine guns. Below was written, uh, we don't do drive-by shootings like they do. We stop. Um, Kraska describes also uh, uh, one uh, police or one SWAT commander that he worked with wearing a T-shirt that carried a picture of a burning city, with gunship helicopters flying overhead, and the caption "quote Op Operation Ghetto Storm." Um, so we see this kind of attitude becomes pervasive within, within police culture, within police departments. We also see this then start to be played out in actual uh, policies and operations. I'm sure most of you uh, have heard of, uh, are, are familiar with what happened in Talia, Texas. Uh, but here, again, was one, uh, one of these uh, joint task forces, joint federal local task forces that was funded basically with federal money. They got federal money for every drug arrest they made. Uh, and so in this particular case, they got an informant who they had some uh, <clears throat> dirt on. Uh, and basically, they gave him a list of 20 people, all of them black, uh, and paid him for each of the people, each of the names on the list uh, for which he could give them evidence uh, to win a conviction. Uh, and so he lied. He just made, he just made shit up, basically. Um, and 40% uh, of Talia's uh, black population ended up getting arrested. Uh, <clears throat> nearly all of those convictions were later overturned when it was revealed that this informant had basically lied through his teeth. Uh, the next year, uh, in Hearn, Texas, the same thing happened. Uh, another informant gave bad information. In this case, there were 28 arrests, 27 of them were black. Uh, 17 of those convictions were later overturned. Um, at, the, at the subsequent lawsuit uh, in Hearn, Texas, bought by a woman named Regina Kelly, uh, there's a great movie called American Violet that's based on what happened in Hearn. I really recommend it. Um, the informant in the case testified, uh, again, uh, that even after Talia, in this case, the informant, the police, the local prosecutor had given the informant, again, a name, a list of names, all of them black, uh, and promised uh, to pay him for each of those people that got convicted based on his testimony. Um, the media was outraged, uh, social justice people were outraged at what happened to both Talia and Hearn. Uh, but as, when I interviewed Kelly, she said this had been happening for 15 years. They just couldn't get anyone to pay attention. Uh, she said the SWAT raids are regular. Uh, it was a direct quote from an interview I did with her. She said, they, quote, they come on helicopters, military style, SWAT style. In the apartments I was living in, in the projects, there were a lot of children outside playing. They don't care. They throw the kids on the ground, put guns to their heads. They're kicking in doors. They just don't care. Um, District Attorney John, Pasch uh, Pashali, or John Paschal, uh, who uh, supplied the list uh, to one of these informants, uh, continued to maintain through the entire incident, and in fact maintains today, uh, that it had nothing to do with race. Uh, he then sort of gives himself up by adding, uh, referring to the people who had been exonerated in these cases, the innocent people who had been wrongly uh, convicted, quote, well, they'll likely reoffend anyway. We don't worry about it too much. Um, so all the war gear, the war tactics, the constant war rhetoric, the dehumanization, um, it shouldn't be any sort of surprise why police have kind of the relationships that they do, 
uh, with communities of color. Um, I'll give you another example of this. Uh, there's a, a, in 2000, the Orlando Weekly did a study of SWAT teams in Orange County, California. Um, and uh, I, I'm just going to read this entire excerpt because I think it's pretty amazing. Uh, the tall bearded man at the door uh, the night, uh, the tall bearded man at the door on the night of November 10th was not just another visitor to Kenneth Kibbs College Park home. You got any, the man asked. What are you talking about, Gibbs answered. The man wanted marijuana. My boys always come here to buy pot, the guy said. No, I don't think so. Gibbs was right. The man's friends had never been to the house because, but to buy drugs because the man, Michael Stevens, was an undercover police detective. Uh, and whether he was tired because he'd just gotten work or because his daughters were watching the window, Gibbs just couldn't keep his anger in. Don't come around here trying to, talking, trying to buy no weed, he yelled at the man. Can't you see my kids are in here? Uh, get the fuck off my property. Dude, I'm leaving, the man, the cop said. Uh, I'm not trying to stress you out. Uh, get off my property, cracker, Gibbs shouted. The slur stung. The man wanted it, uh, or the man wanted to make it look that way. This is the police officer. Why do you have to call me that, he said. Why do you have to stress me out like that? Um, what the Orlando paper found basically was that the Orlando police were just sending undercover cops into black neighborhoods just to knock on random doors and ask if they could buy weed. There was no reason to suspect that this guy was selling pot, um, but it was entire, they were basically targeting entire neighborhoods. Um, that was in 2000, 15 years ago, right? Uh, fast forward to 2009, uh, nine years later. The Orlando Police Department uh, suspects, uh, actually it's the Orlando Sheriff's Department, suspects that there's drug activity going on in black-owned barbershops across the city. Uh, but they don't have enough evidence to actually get a search warrant, which means they don't have any evidence at all. Uh, so what do they do? Uh, they go to the state's local occupational licensing board uh, and they get a, 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 hair, a barber inspector to go along with the SWAT teams. And they raid each of these barber shops with the SWAT team. But because they have somebody from the Occupational Licensing Board with them officially, these are just inspections to make sure all these barbers are properly licensed to cut hair. They're just uh, performing them with the SWAT team. Um, 47 people were arrested in these raids. Over, uh, uh, they raided over 12, uh, I think 12 or 13 uh, uh, barber shops across the city. Um, 47 people were arrested. 44 of them were arrested for barbering without a license. Uh, two people were arrested for drug possession, and they did find one person with enough drugs to charge with a felony. I'd submit that if you raided 13 businesses of any kind in a city of the size of Orlando, you would probably get at least that many people uh, possessing drugs. Um, I'm going to wrap up a little bit. Um, when you argue that the drug war is racist, uh, a, commonly, a common reply from defenders of drug prohibition that it's unfair to say that because you're implicating cops, prosecutors, judges, and so on without actually knowing anything about them. And it's true. Uh, I think many people who do operate within the criminal justice system do so with the best of intentions. Many of them, in fact, are black. Uh, and I have no doubt that many of them genuinely feel about that by waging the draw on, war on drugs, they are protecting black people. Uh, but here's the thing. That doesn't matter. Uh, the drug war is racist by design. It was intended to be this way. Uh, a system designed to, to discriminate will be racist and will discriminate even if everyone operating in that system uh, is doing so with the purest heart and the best of intentions. Um, in response to, say, uh, the protest and subsequent riots here in Baltimore, the protests in Ferguson, uh, police, shooting of, 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 uh, police shootings of black men, uh, we often hear about black-on-black -black crime or problems with black culture. Here's a statistic to keep in mind when you hear these arguments. During alcohol prohibition, the homicide rate in America soared 80%. After prohibition was repealed, it returned to pre-prohibition levels. When Nixon re reinvigorated the drug war in the early 70s, the homicide rate spiked. When Reagan ramped it up in the mid-1980s, violent crime spiked. When the U.S. persuaded Mexico to bring its army in to fight the drug war, literally militarizing the drug war, the homicide rate in Mexico climbed to astronomical rates. <clears throat> this is because black markets create violence. No one ever killed someone else over a uh, Michelob uh, deal gone bad. Uh, alcohol retailers compete by offering more selection, better service, lower prices. Someone steals from a liquor store, the owner calls the cops. None of that is possible in the drug market because it's a black market. So drug, drug distributors, distributors compete with violence. Disputes are settled with bloodshed. Customers are won over with turf wars. It only makes sense that the communities in which the government is most aggressively fighting the drug war would also experience the most violence. The bootleggers of the 1920s were disproportionately recent immigrants from Italy, Germany, Germany and other parts of Europe. We don't attribute prohibition era violence to, quote, white European culture. Uh, likewise, the violence of black communities today isn't because of black culture, it's the culture of prohibition. Um, 
And of all those SWAT raids, the long prison sentences, the abuse of informants, the dehumanization, and the various other direct applications of the drug war, this violence, this violence that's created by prohibition, is probably the most destructive and pernicious, pernicious consequence of all. Um, here you have a, the black community in America had just basically, uh, uh, basically been desegregated, or at least sort of legally desegregated, if not uh, in practice desegregated. Uh, and the ink had barely dried on those decisions before uh, Nixon then implements this uh, very destructive drug war. Uh, there was barely even any time to recover from Jim Crow before now uh, you have all of the perverse incentives of the drug war uh, infiltrating uh, black communities. White America has a long and shameful history of enslaving, subjugating, exploiting, and discriminating against people of color. Uh, but the modern drug war, I think, has done something none of those policies ever could. Uh, is it created a host of incentives that induce black communities to destroy themselves. I would argue that uh, with the possible exception of slavery, the modern drug war is the single most destructive policy in American history. That has been exceptionally harmful to black America was no accident. Uh, this was always by design. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me out to speak and I uh, look forward to the uh, question and answer session.